statistics um, is grouped into two parts. The one part is the ungrouped data. That is where you received a full set of data, but the data set is small enough that you don't have to um, group them together. For instance, you don't have five sixes and 28s. And so we only have a data set and you can see the whole set of data. So it's not grouped together. By this stage, you should know that there are certain indicators that will indicate to us how well the data is centralized around your median and the influence of your um, average and your median on the data, because that is what we should do to data. And that is why you do statistics is that you should be able to make a conclusion after you've summarized the data and you must be able to tell the value of this data set. Okay, we have certain indicators. The first indicator is the range. The range is the highest value minus the lowest value that you should know by this stage because you're doing that for a long time. What came in in grade 11 and you guys actually had miss this out last year if your teachers didn't do the full curriculum is the position of the first quartile and the third quartile. The first one, uh, the second quartile, you will know very well because that is exactly the same as your median. That is why, what you call the median in grade 8, 9 and 10. And then we just add the first quartile and the third quartile. Now, the word quartile should give you an indication of what a quartile is. It's the a value that divides our data set into four quarters. The medium divides our uh, data set in half and the first quartile uh, divides the first half in another half and the fourth, uh, the third quartile divides the second half our data in half. The another word also that you need to know is your interquartile range. Now your interquartile range is just Q3 minus Q1. And from those values, we're going to set up a box and whisker diagram to just visualize what we've said theoretically now. OK, so what do we need the box and for the box and whisker? We need our minimum value. That's our five number summary. The first one is the minimum. The next one is quarter one. And we first going to calculate the position of the first quartile, and then we need quartile two. We first calculate the position and then the actual quartile, um, quartile two, that's your median. And then we calculate Q3. We first calculate the position and then the value. And then at the end, we use the maximum. The ma minimum and the maximum are obvious values in the smallest value and the largest one. And that immediately tells you, before you start with your five number summary, please sort your values from the smallest to the largest. And then you can immediately read off the minimum value and you can read off the maximum value. Okay, let's do one. And First, very, very important, when you draw your box and whisker, before you draw that little box that you can see now, you must draw a number line like you usually draw an axis on um, a graph. And you must number your number line, not according to your quartiles or the values that you have. You must number your number line with 
uh, values with the same distance between your indicators. Okay, there you have minimum value, lower quartile, median, sorry for that mistake in the spelling of median, upper quartile, and your maximum. Okay, and then important, I've already stressed that your data is divided into quarters. So between your minimum and quartile one, you have 25% of your data points. Between quartile one and two, you have 25%. Between quartile two and three, also 25%. And between quartile three and your maximum, you also have 25%. So if you get a weird question like, how many uh, a percentage of your data points will be below your median? You say it's 50% because you have 25% up to your quartile one and then 25% between quartile one and quartile two. And also, what percentage of your data is above quartile three? Then you say it is 25%. It doesn't matter what the form of your box and whisper, uh, whisker um, diagram looks like. OK, if the data is centralized, like the first example, that's the ideal. Then your um, data set is symmetrical about your median. The uh, left hand side and the right hand side of uh, your quartile one and quartile three, they're the same distance away from your median. However, that is uh, utopia. That doesn't always happen. So at the bottom, you will see two um, box and whiskers. The left hand side, the median is to the right. Can you see it's not in the center? And we call that skew to the left. It's the same number of data points that lies on the left of your median, but the values of those data points are bigger than the values to the right of your median. And on the right hand side, can you see your median is moved to the left? So now the values of your half of the points that lies to the right of your median, they are now the values of those points are bigger. It's the same number of points, the values are just bigger. Okay, we use this to make a call on the distribution of your data. If your median, um, the difference between quartile three and your median is equal to the difference between quartile two and quartile one, then you have a normal distrib uh, distribution. If um, the value of your quartile three minus your median is bigger than, can you see the distance between quartile three and your median is bigger than the difference between quartile two and quartile one, then you say the data is positively skewed or skewed to the right. The opposite also happens. If you have the value to the, um, the uh, median move to the right, then you say your data is negatively skewed. OK, this is just another um, way of presenting the same um, value or what you see on your Boskin whisker you will know about the bell graph. And this is what we see on the left hand side. You see a bell graph that is negatively skewed or skewed to the left. And on the right hand side, you one have one that is skewed to the right uh, or positive skew. On the left hand side, the little X with a line on top we call that is the one that we know from our calculator. That is our mean and Q2 is our median. So if our mean is less than the median, that means that the values that lies to the left of your uh, median, 
those values are smaller. I stress again the same number of values, but the values are smaller. And the opposite, if you have a positive skew um, bell graph, the mean will be bigger than your median. Please remember those because they usually ask you in a paper, why do you make a certain uh, judgment about the skewness of the data? OK, so that's just another way. Um, the number of years um, negatively skewed to the right, um, positive to the right. I think that the graph on top is raw, uh, is right, but this one is wrong. I think just the, um, the writing on the left should be changed. OK, there you have another one. Those data the, um, on the right hand side, I also don't think that this is the, the normal one is right because you have the median on the right, your mean is equal to your median. But on the left one, I think that this graph is wrong. Your, um, your values on the left hand side is bigger, therefore your um, mean will be bigger. Than, than your median. OK, but that is not important. Just remember, we're going to use the box and whisker, uh, whisker and not these graphs in the exams. OK, now it comes to where you can get out your calculator and we can work through this. Please have your calculator and work through uh, with me. This is an example that we want to show you how to calculate all your five uh, indicators, your five uh, number summary. Question one, and that comes from June 2016. On a certain day, a tour operator sent 11 tour buses to 11 different destinations. The table shows the number of passengers on each bus. Again, it's important to know the context of the problem. Calculate the mean number of passengers traveling on the tour bus. How are we going to do this? Mean means I'm going to add all the values and I'm going to divide by 11. But at this stage, you should be able to put your calculator on stat mode and just type in the values and you will get the little X with a line on top and that will tell you what the mean of those data is. But because we ha only have a limited number of points, we can add all the numbers and divide it by the number of points. So if you have 11 values, you can divide by 11, you must divide by 11. And please remember, although all, all our data points are integers, we do not round this in, uh, the mean to an integer. We keep it as a decimal number. OK, now we want to write the five number summary for the data. It's the same data set. So the values that we're looking for is the minimum. Our data set has already been organized from small to big. So the minimum is eight. The maximum is 26. And how do we calculate the median? We have 11 numbers. So the sixth number will be our median, and that's the 19. Because this data set is so small, we can then ignore the 19 and to the left of the 19, we have five data points. So the third one from the left, the 10 will be Q1. And the third one from the right, number 24, that will be Q3. Therefore, the five point summary will be eight, 10, 19, 24, and 26. So we've written that down. So we've done number 1.2. Now they want us to draw 
a box and whisker diagram for the data. So, like I stressed before, you must start with your number line. You must have equal divisions between the numbers on the uh, at the bottom. Can you see they've used 6, 8, 10, uh, 10, 14, 12, 14. And then you plot your smallest value is above the 8. Q1 is 10, so you draw a vertical line. And can you see they indicate all the numbers on your number line? It's important to give rather more information than less information. So write down the value for, uh, for uh, your minimum, write down your value for Q1, write down the 19 on the number line for Q2, and the 24 for Q3, and then the 26. And then they want to, uh, are you satisfied? Please um, send your questions. Um, when I stopped presenting, we can try and answer all the questions. Or Mr. Schutz can do that for us. On number 1.4, they want us refer to the box and whisker diagram and comment on the skewness of the data. Our Q2 is at 19. And we have already calculated the uh, mean of the data, and the mean of the data has been 17.19, so the mean is less than the um, median. So if we have to write it down, the numbers on the left-hand side are bigger than the numbers on the right-hand side, and therefore we say the data is skewed to the left or negatively skewed. And if you look at the number, we said our median is 19, and the values on the left-hand side um, is so much smaller. Okay, satisfied there? And now we go to the standard deviation. Okay, now you should have your calculator in front of you. We want to calculate, we're still with the, busy with the same data set, and we want to calculate the standard deviation. The standard deviation is also an indicator, uh, indication about the centralization of the data. Okay, so now we go to our calculators and we press mode on the left hand side, top left hand side. I'm using the standard deviation as on the um, Casio calculators, I'm certain you have a teacher or somebody with you that will, you can ask to just help you sort out your calculator. So you pressed mode and then two for stat and then one because we're going to do the variance option and then you enter your data. So you press the number and you press equal to enter that data point. And then a number again, equal again, until you make certain that you entered 11 data points. Just check yourself after you've entered all your data to make certain that you entered all your data. And the moment you've entered all your data, you can then press AC to store that data. Okay, now we've entered the data, but now we can just press the little button to give us the answer. And how we do we that? We press shift stat, that's the number just above the one, and then four for variance. And then you have that little sigma x. You press the three to get that, and that will give us the standard deviation. I hope you all see 6.46. I think the best way of remembering the skewness of the data is to look at your box and whisker. I know that learners tend to look at the position of the median. And if the median is to the right, they want to say that the data is skewed to the right. But that is not how you should interpret it. 
you look at the position of the median. The values, if the median is to the right of your box and whisker, it indicates that most of the values lies, not the most of the values, it's the same number of values, but the um, values to your left is smaller than the ones. So it's just this opposite. It's like moving a graph to the left or to your right. Can you remember when we did graphs? And if we said X plus one, we actually move the graph to the left. This is one of those things again. So if you see your median to the right of your graph, you know that the graph is skewed to the left. Okay, this data set is skewed to the left. I hope it um, um, explains a little bit. I'm going to go on and then we can, uh, when you do your example, we can talk about this again at a later stage. Okay, okay, number 1.6. They say a tour is regarded popular if the number of passengers on the tour is one standard deviation above, bigger than the mean. How many destinations were popular on this particular day? The word above just tells you that you have to go above the mean. So we need to take our mean and we've calculated the mean as 17.18. We've done that in the previous exercise and we want above the mean. So we take the mean and we add one um, value one times the standard deviation and that will bring us to 23.64. And now we go back to our data set and we Look where we can find 23.63 and 23.64, sorry, is between 21 and 24. So there will be three destinations that were popular on that specific day, the 24, the 25 and the 26, because those were the destinations that received more than 23.63 visits on that specific day. Okay. There they mark the 24, the 25 and the 26. And you can also mark it. Please guys make notes on um, the booklet that you have in front of you. Okay. This is just a formal memo, memo on how they will mark this in a final exams. Um, so one mark for the 189 because you added that and then one mark for the 17.18 but you will also receive full marks because you can actually do that on your calculator number 1.2 one mark for the minimum and maximum one mark for the median and then one mark for q1 and q3 um, the box and whisker um, two marks the data, sorry, the data skewed to the left. Two marks for your um, standard deviation and then one mark for your interval. So please guys show your interval. Don't just write your answer. Can you see there's no little note here that you will get full marks for your answer. So rather do the calculations and then you make your decision. If you made uh, some mistake in your um, calculations and you've interpreted your data correctly, you will still get that last mark. So don't leave, um, leave um, calculations out when you do your work. Okay, more box and whisker uh, questions. And I think this is now um, just an example again. The box and whisker diagram shows the marks out of 80. So the maximum mark is 80. Can you see the maximum mark indicated there? Um, the comment on the skewness of the data. Okay, now we can talk about the skewness of the data. Can you see where our median lies? Our median is at 62. 
So it's moved to the right. So our um, data set will be negatively skewed or skewed to the left. OK. Next one. Write down the range of the values obtained. The range is just the maximum value minus the smallest value, and that is equal to 16. This you should be able to do. And then that little question, if a learner has had to obtain 32 uh, marks to pass the test, estimate the percentage of the class that failed the test. How many, 20, uh, how many, uh, what percentage failed? You just look for the uh, 32. So 32 is the mark to pass, and we know that 25% of our data, even if we don't have the data, 25% of our data points will be below 32. Okay, if they ask you at this one, okay, there you see the answer, 25% of the learners failed. If they ask you how many, uh, what percentage of the learners had above 75 percent? Of 75 out of 80 for the test, you would say 25 percent. 25 percent of all learners had between 75 and 80 for the test. How many learners had less than 62 for the test? I can't hear your answers now, but you should say 50%. If I ask you how many learners had above 62 uh, two out of 50 for the test, you should tell me that is 50%. Okay, let's move on. Um, now, maximum and min is minimum. There you have it. Uh, we've already spoken about that. 25% of the learners felt. Okay, there you have your data set. In um, um, ascending order, the second mark is 28. Okay, this is one of those um, level three or level four uh, questions in your question paper. So we have to think a little bit about this question. In ascending order, that's important that you have that. The second mark is 28. The third mark is 36. And the sixth mark is 69. The seventh and the eighth marks are the same. The average mark for this test is 54. And now we must fill in the marks of the, ra uh, the remaining learners in ascending order. I'm just going to give you a few minutes to think about that before I give you the answer. So I'm going to give you five minutes. And you might talk about it amongst yourselves. Hello, I'm a bit confused. With this question. Okay, I'll explain it to you now. I just want you to think about it. Please use the value. They give us the value of the median. They also give us the value of Q1. You have the value of Q3. You can immediately write in your minimum and you can write in your maximum. Those two values you should have written down right from the start. Your minimum and your maximum you can write in. And then I think the next clue is your median, uh, your um, Q1. Okay, do you give up? Can I continue? I think you had five minutes now. Okay, let's go. Your minimum is 20, so it goes in the first block. Your maximum is 80, so it goes in the last block. 
The next one is, can you see where your median should be? How many data points do you have? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine data points. So the middle one, the fifth one, must be exactly the same as the value of your median. Can you see four data points to the left, four data points to the right, and the 62, that is your median, okay? So we've used the values just from our box and wisp uh, pot, uh, uh, plot at this stage. Okay, now they tell us also that the seventh and the eighth marks are the same. Where does our Q3 comes from? Let me just see whether they first use that. No, they first use the, um, the Q1, that is the 32. Can you see those two values? Add it and divide it by two. That will give you the 32. So we've used that one. The um, seventh and eighth points. If we add those two together and divide by two, we should get the 75. But they also tell us that those two values are the same. So both of them should be 75. And now we have only one left. And for that, we use the fact that they gave us the average mark of this test is 54. So we add all the values plus the missing one divided by nine must give us 54. So 54 will be equal to, because we have the mean or the average, 54 will be equal to four for five, that's the sum of all the given values that we have, plus term four divided by nine must be equal to 54. And then we multiply by nine, the 54 by nine, we subtract the four for five, and then we should get that T4 is equal to 41. Okay, guys, was it very difficult, that one? Or could you um, understand that? Okay, have a look at that one again. Please look carefully because this is, now you're given the box and whisker and you should be able to work back towards your data set. I hope you enjoyed that. Okay, now here we are with the scatter plot. Um, and for the scatter plot, normally they give you the data. And like any graph, it's very important that you first decide about your axes. Normally they will give you um, a template to do your um, scatter plot on. But if not, it's very important that you divide your axes in um, the correct way. So the top one is usually um, at the bottom, that's your horizontal axis. So the temperature at midday and um, on the um, vertical axis, you have your number of bottles of water. Okay, we have read this. Um, we started when we swapped presenters, but I just want to stress again that it's very important that you understand what's happening here. So on the first day of each month, um, they recorded information about the temperature of the day. That is on your uh, horizontal axis. And the number of 500 milliliters bottles, sorry for the mistake again, a spelling mistake of water, that was sold at the tuck shop of a certain school during lunch break. And the data is shown in the table and presented on the scatter plot. The least regression line for this data is drawn on the sc scatter plot. So normally you've seen the whole package now, but usually they will show you only the data points and you have to draw the scatter plot. Now, after you've done your axes, you will take your data points and please remember these data normally is not 
organized from small to big. So it can be uh, small and big, and but you must keep the data sets together. So you um, go to 18 on your X axis and 12 on your Y axis, and that's your first dot. And you continue, that's 19. Your temperature is 19 and your uh, number of bottles is 13. So there is your uh, next value and you continue to draw that. And um, do you want me to go just back? But you just draw all the data points. We'll get to the uh, line um, shortly. So the next one, they want you to identify an outlier on the data. So we have a formula that we calculate outliers on, but uh, when you do a scatter plot, you can immediately see which data point is out of line with the rest. Uh, excuse the pun. It's that one. So it's very far away from the data. So you try and find that point. What is the X value for that point? Um, the temperature for that point that is 30 degrees and the number of bottles is 53. So that is the outlier. Then they want us to determine the equation of least square regression line. And now we use our calculators, a wonderful tool that we have available. Um, the method that we use is also by using the stats. And then you have in your booklet, you should also have the um, instructions on how to do that. Now we do, go to mode again, and then we do two, that's stat, but then you must choose regression. So we need to enter the previous exercise. We only entered one set of values, but now we need to enter both um, sets of values. So you start with your temperatures because that will be your X values. You can swap between your X and Y values, but I found that my learners found it easier to type in 18 equals 21 equals 19 equals until they've entered all the temperatures. And then when you just press your little round button in the middle, once it will move to the top and then you enter all your Y values. I'm just going to give you a moment or two to enter those values and that you can um, give me an indication whether you are used to entering these values or do you need a little bit more assistance? Thank you, ma'am. We have about 30 minutes uh, remaining. For the educators in the venues, um, please make sure that you complete the attendance register as it was pasted in the chat, the link to the attendance register. And then also feel feel free to send your uh, answers via the WhatsApp if you have any, or alternatively raise your hand and then we can allow you to to communicate to speak as, um, like that as well. Okay. If I don't get any questions, I assume that you've all entered your data. Okay, please remember to press AC at the end to save those data because we're working with more data and if you have to re-enter it, you're going to waste a lot of time. Now, to get the answer out, we're going to um, go to shift stat. That's again the uh, yellow um, stat above the number one on your calculator. And if you press that, you will um, get um, a question where you have different values. The one is an A, 
The two is the B and the three is the R. And those are the values that we need at this stage. So if we put that in, you get an A value of negative 38.51. B is equal to 2.68. So your regression equation is equal to Y equals 2.68X minus 38.51. I hope everybody got that. And then the R, please um, also do the R. Um, we will talk about R later because that will indicate to us how good the, regret, uh, the regression equation actually fits our data. Number 2.3. They want us now to estimate the number of bottles of water that will be sold if the temperature is 28 degrees at midday. So we have the equation. Our temperatures are our X values. So we use the same equation and we just put in the 28 into X's place and we calculate the number of bottles of water. Can you see they also did not um, round the final number? Okay. Now we have the scatter plot again. Would you see the relation between the temperature at midday and the number of bottles as weak or strong? And we must motivate our answer. So we will look at the line and we can see that it's only that outlier that we've in identified that is outside and lying uh, far away from the line. So we will say this is a strong relationship between the temperature and the number of bottles of water salt. So, and that we also do use um, the R4. If your R value is 0 0.98, that indicates that it's a very strong positive relationship between the temperature at midday and the number of bottles of water. And then they want us to give um, a reason why the observed data for this data cannot continue indefinitely. And um, that is one of those questions that's not actually mathematics, but common sense. The temperature cannot continue um, soaring because then we won't survive. And also the number of bottles of water that somebody can consume can also not um, continue unlimitedly. So we can't go this on indefinitely. That's just uh, one of those questions that the teachers can't really uh, prepare you for, but you have to think about and write down yourself. Okay. Statistics, next, grouped data. Um, now we back at the position of our um, first quarter. Can you remember the formula that we used for um, larger groups of ungrouped data? We had it so quarter times in plus one. But for your grouped data, you use Q1 equals a quarter times N. Position of your second quartile is a half N, and the position for your third quartile is three quarters N. These data sets are too big for us to write all of them in um, ascending order. So we have to group them together. So we need additional skills to interpret our data. And the first one we use is a cumulative frequency graph or our GIF. And that is just a summary. Can you see they grouped um, your number of messages um, between 10 and 20? And the number of days that between 10, 10 or 20 messages have been received um, is two. If you look at um, 60 to 70, it's 18. 
So we call this um, 60 to 17 also your modal class because we sometimes call the intervals classes. So you just get used to the um, terminology also that that doesn't defer you when you're working in your paper. OK, number 2.1, Cal estimate the mean number of uh, messages sent per day rounded off to two decimal places. Can you see um, we can only estimate because we don't have the original data, so we have to use our calculators to decide um, which value we're going to use between tw uh, 10 and 20 if we have um, two Num two days where we have between 10 and 20. And what we use is we use the middle uh, the number in the middle between 10 and 20. So we say we have two 15s and we have eight 25s and 15 35s. So we get the middle of each of our intervals. And then if we want to calculate the mean, we take 15 times 2 plus 25 times 8 plus 35 times and etc. And so the total is 3080 divided by 60. So the average number of messages per day will be 51.33. Um, so this is why we it's only estimated and not a real mean. OK, what we also uh, want to draw is our, our guide. So the number of messages um, on the horizontal axis and please name your vertical axis correctly. It's the cumul uh, cumulative frequency, uh, frequency on the left hand side and this is the OGIVE. How do we get the values that we must plot? We add the numbers in each interval. So it's two is the first one and then we say two plus eight is ten and 10 plus 5 is 15, 15 plus 10 is 25, so we add all the values, and then we plot the right-hand interval, the biggest number of your interval, together with the 2. So the uh, coordinate set that we plot is 22, and the next one will be 30, 10, 40, 15, and there you have all your points. Your OGIVE is a line that will connect all those points. And then remember, please, you must always plot the left margin of your first interval down to a Y value of zero and connect your points. OK, number 2.3, there's your OGIVE. Estimate the number of days on which 45, uh, 65 or more messages um, were sent. So we must look at 65, and the important thing is you must decide on which axis you're looking for that 65. You're looking for 65 messages, so you will have to look on your horizontal axis, and that is the 65 between 60 and 70. You move up in a straight line vertically to, uh, to your OGIVE, and then you go back a, a left to your frequency, and that is 65. Please remember that that 46 is the number of messages where it was less than um, the number of messages, 64 days, it was sent less than 65 messages. So please just be um, careful of that. And then you must say they estimate was sent more than those messages. So you must go to the 60 and you must subtract the 46. This, um, the, yeah, the 60, uh, the 46. Those are the message days that sent less. So if you want more, you must take your total and subtract the 46. OK, so that's your OGIVE. If you want to 
determine, oh, that's your histogram. I assume that you are familiar with the histogram. Sometimes they ask you to identify the modal class. Okay, that's easy because only that's the one way we have the most. And the modal class will then be between 50 and 60. And can you see, you can include either the 50 or the 60. Okay, if they want you to draw from your histogram, you must set up your cumulative frequency um, table. Then you must first indicate your classes, and they have indicated that for you already. And then you just write down your frequencies. And from your frequencies, now you can um, write down your cumulative frequencies. Cumulative means you adding. So 1 plus 7 is 8 and 8 plus 13 is 21. So you just continue adding like that. And if we want to draw the uh, frequency, uh, the cumulative frequency graph or your OGAF, you again plot the 30 with the 1, the 40 with the 8, and there you have your graph. And you must remember to just join your 20 with your zero on your frequency graph. Okay, so we've done that already. We've done the frequency graph. And um, yeah, we've remembered that and the modal um, class. Sometimes you, you can read your modal class from your frequency, like we've done uh, from our histogram also. Or if you have your um, OGIVE, you're looking for the part of your graph when it increases the most and where the uh, gradient is the steepest. Okay, um, they, the next question. The tra traffic department sends speeding fines to all motorists whose speed exceeds um, 66 kilometers per hour. Estimate the number of motorists who will receive a speeding ticket. So again, you go to 66 kilometers per hour, that's on your horizontal um, axis. You go up to your guide and you read it from the left hand side, and that will be 44. All of them, um, so their speeds were less than uh, uh, 66. There's a total of 55, and again, you must subtract the two to get 11. Okay, okay. <clears throat> what they um, usually uh, also give you is the frequency graph. Sometimes they ask you to calculate the median. Now, it's important to remember that your maximum number will be the biggest number um, on your cumulative frequency. So, in this case, you have time in minutes, you have a cumulative frequency with a maximum of 30, so your median's position will be at half times 30 and it will be at 15. So at 15, you will be able to read your median. And if you go down, your median will be about 6.9 minutes. The same way we can calculate our interquartile range. For our interquartile range, we need Q3, so that's three quarters of the 30 data points that we have. That will be 22.5. And then you go to the OGIVE, you read down your value at the bottom, and that will be 8.5. Also, you need your quartal one. So you calculate a quarter of 30, 7.5. You read it at the bottom, and that will be 4.5. So our uh, interquartile range will then be equal to 8.5 minus 4.5, and that is equal to 4. Okay. They give you um, the frequency, uh, the OGIVE, and they want us to complete the frequency table. So now we don't have our intervals, we don't have our frequencies, but we know where the OGIVE comes from, so we're moving backwards now. Our interval, first interval, is between 1 and 3. 
the next one between three and five, and then five and seven, seven and nine, etc. And how do we get our frequency? We know that the first one is at, uh, at one, yeah, so the value is zero. And at three, the value is three. So the coordinates of that point is three, three. Coordinates of the second point is five, nine. Coordinates of the next points, seven, 16, et cetera. And now we want to calculate from that our cumulative frequency and our normal frequency. Now we're working backwards. First, a cumulative frequency. The next one was 9, 16, 24, 29, and 31. And how do we get the frequency? To get the cumulative, we add it. So to get to our normal frequency, we subtract. The first one is always the same. And then 9 minus um, 3 is 6. And then you take the 16 minus 9, and you get the 7, the 8, the 5, and the 2. So if we have the OGIF, we can set up our own cumulative.